Welcome to the sixth episode in a Legendarium series about the Wars of the Roses. In this installment, The Princes in the Tower, we will talk about how Richard of Gloucester seized power and may have arranged for the disappearance of his two nephews to secure the throne. Upon the death of his brother, King Edward IV, Duke Richard of Gloucester moved quickly. He hurried to meet his eldest nephew, Edward, the heir to the throne, on his return journey, supposedly to escort him personally. After dining with his nephew and his escorts on April 30th, Richard of Gloucester, despite his nephew's protests, had the escorts arrested and placed his nephew Edward in the Tower of London, supposedly for his own safety. Elizabeth Woodville, King Edward's widow, did not trust her brother-in-law Richard at all, so she gathered up her younger son, also named Richard, her servants, and headed for sanctuary at Westminster Abbey. She brought so many possessions with her that her servants had to break down a section of the abbey walls to get everything in sight, and legend has it that she took part of the royal treasury into sanctuary and divided it between members of her family. Not long after Elizabeth's arrival, Duke Richard ordered that Richard the Younger join his brother Edward at the tower. Although she resisted, Elizabeth finally bid farewell to her younger son Richard, never to see him again. At first, putting Edward V and his brother Duke Richard of York in the tower did not raise suspicions. The two boys remained very young and vulnerable, and Parliament was worried about their safety. Additionally, the tower served as the starting point for the coronation process, and new monarchs traditionally dwelled there until the ceremony. Nonetheless, the ruling class of England remained deeply concerned about the prospect of another child king after the last one, Henry VI, brought England to ruin. At first, Duke Richard set his nephew's coronation for June 22, 1483, and began preparations like minting coins. And then suddenly, just weeks before the ceremony, Parliament declared the princes illegitimate on the grounds that their father, Edward IV, had contracted to marry Lady Eleanor Butler before he married Elizabeth Woodville, which made their marriage invalid and the princes bastards. The priests of London announced this from their lecterns, which inspired the citizens of London to petition Richard of Gloucester, the eldest of King Edward's surviving siblings, to become their new king. On July 6, Richard of Gloucester became King Richard III. It is unknown what role he played in the events that led to his taking the crown, but there's no doubt Richard III benefited. Though the Wars of the Roses saw many power grabs, those grabbing power always went to great efforts to portray their seizures of power as being a restoration and that their claim to the throne was the strongest. But when King Richard III seized power, he made no secret of his ambition and his barefaced coup troubled many, even within the House of York. His first target became one of his late brother's mistresses, Jane Shore. After the death of her royal partner, Jane took Baron William Hastings as her new lover. Richard deeply disliked Shore, not just because he believed that she led his brother into temptation, but because he distrusted her connections to the Woodville family. So he accused her of promiscuity and carrying messages between Baron Hastings and Edward's widow Elizabeth Woodville. Richard III ordered Shore to perform public penance at Paul's Cross. She had to march through the streets dressed only in her kirtle with a candle in her hand. Richard III showed some clemency to other members of the supposed conspiracy, but everyone knew that Richard III was willing to use force to assert his claim to the throne. 
Even during their uncle's coronation, the two nephews were moved by Richard of Gloucester's men to the inner apartments of the White Tower, which served as a royal prison. With each passing day, they began to be seen more and more rarely behind the bars and windows of the White Tower. Witnesses last saw them on June 16th when a chronicler recorded them shooting arrows and playing in the garden of the tower. That would be the last time anyone saw them, and it did not take long for rumors to begin circulating that Uncle Richard had murdered them. Elizabeth Woodville and her remaining children came out of sanctuary at Westminster and appeared to reconcile with Richard III, largely because she had no other choice. Elizabeth Woodville later renounced worldly wealth and entered a convent in London. Upon her death, she requested burial in a simple tomb next to her original husband in St. George's Chapel. So, did Richard III murder his nephews? There is not much direct evidence. Workers found the skeletal remains of two boys about the ages of the two princes while working in the tower two centuries later. Put on display, many assumed them to be young Richard and Edward, but the truth is not known for certain, and there's no evidence that the two boys were murdered rather than dying of natural causes. In later years, a pretender emerged in the courts of Europe, claiming to be Duke Richard of York, spared by his uncle's henchmen because of his youth. Of course, the pretender's actual lineage remained unknown. So, did Richard III have his nephews murdered? He did stand to gain the most, as he had enemies at court who would happily use the young princes as figureheads for a rebellion. Of course, some believe that after seizing the throne in 1485, Henry Tudor found the boys in the tower and murdered them to cement his power with the blood of his most important rivals. In the end, there's just not enough evidence to know for certain. But rightly or wrongly, Richard of Gloucester remains the prime suspect because he stood to gain the most, and he held all the cards in 1483. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.